This week on Wealth Track, we travel to Paris to interview two great investors about their calls for new thinking on economics, Federal Reserve policy, and investing. Leg Mason's legendary Bill Miller and bond master Paul McCauley are next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. New facts require new approaches. That is one of the themes we have been preaching since WealthTrack's beginning in 2005. Whether it's been the new world economic order of rising emerging market clout, or the boom and bust of the credit and housing bubbles, or the need for guaranteed sources of income in retirement, we and our guests have tried to track the biggest changes to help you, our viewers, prosper through them. Some of the most significant shifts have occurred on the macro level. In response to the financial crisis, central banks around the globe have been making money available and cheap to try to make sure the world does not slip into another serious recession. Central banks have used a variety of tools ranging from lowering interest rates to buying and in some cases guaranteeing government debt and providing generous lending to banks. Many of the moves have been unprecedented and controversial, especially the Fed's multi-year guarantee of low short-term interest rates and the European Central Bank's Longer Term Refinancing Operation, or LTRO, which gives enormous and cheap three-year loans to Eurozone commercial banks. I went to Paris recently to moderate a panel at a conference devoted to re-examining central bank orthodoxy for unorthodox times. It was held at the Banque de France, France's central bank. Two of the speakers at the conference are familiar WealthTrack guests. Each is a great investor, and they are also close friends. So we decided to sit them down together for a wealth track exclusive to discuss some of the unorthodox approaches they are recommending. Leg Mason's legendary Bill Miller needs no introduction. He is the only mutual fund manager to beat the market for an astounding 15 years in a row. Although his 1991 through 2005 winning streak came to an end, and it's been a tougher slog since, Miller remains one of the most creative and thoughtful forces in the investment business. In late April, he is stepping down from the Leg Mason Value Trust Fund, which he has run for 30 years. But he will continue to manage Leg Mason's Opportunity Trust Fund and share Leg Mason Capital Management. Paul McCulley is another great investor and financial thought leader. Until late 2010, he was a senior partner at PIMCO, where he ran the firm's huge $400 billion plus short-term trading desk was a key member of its investment policy committee and author of its monthly Global Central Bank Focus. Paul is now chair of the Global Interdependence Center Society of Fellows, part of a Philadelphia-based think tank which promotes international dialogue. In Paris, he presented a thought-provoking paper on why conventional monetary policy does not work in the current economic situation, which he describes as a liquidity trap and why expansive government spending is key to avoiding recession or worse. McCulley coined the term Minsky moment, which described the crash of the global financial system, something the late economist Hyman Minsky predicted would happen. Minsky's theory was that long periods of economic stability, such as we had in the late 1980s through the 90s and into the 2000s, would lead to ever more risk-taking and culminate in periods of financial instability, which is exactly what happened. I began the interview by asking Bill Miller about a key assertion that he made in his Paris speech, Time Travel in the Minsky Moment, that we need a paradigm shift in economic thinking. Well, ultimately, the entire model of, of economics needs to change because it grew out of a 
physics envy. And so kind of classic, classic economics followed classic mechanics in physics. And of course, what happened with Newtonian mechanics was Einstein came along and said, well, there's this thing called relativity. And that changed everything. And then, then quantum mechanics came along and Einstein said, well, that can't be right because it doesn't, it doesn't mesh, the, the little micro doesn't mesh with the macro. It's a very similar thing in economics, where classical economics, microeconomics, and even macroeconomics that Keynes in that it works most of the time. But way out in the tails of the distribution at very unusual times, sort of like the equivalent of, of the very small in quantum mechanics, but way out where we are right now in Paul's area of liquidity traps and, and the reverse Minsky journey that we'll probably talk about, that just doesn't work. And so what you need is a completely different approach to economics that comes out of really complex systems theory. Economics is, is, is driven by this hydraulic metaphor, like a, like a big clanking water machine. So you heard about fun flows and overheating and pressure and cooling off and all of these metaphors that, that d drive your thinking. And that's not the way the economy, the economy works at all. The economy, right now, it doesn't work that way. Well, it way. doesn't work that way anyway. Okay. Uh, but, but broadly speaking, what the economy consists of is all these agents, you know, people out there behaving locally under whatever conditions they find themselves. And that gives rise to an economic system with economic phenomena. And you have to study that both at the microeconomic level, people's individual behaviors right. and, and firm behavior, but also the aggregation of the behavior so that you, you, can't, you can't deduce the economy's or, or induce or infer the economy's behavior from the behavior of individuals. You've got to look at the system as a whole. And I think that's where you get these things called emergent phenomena, things that you just wouldn't expect when you see individuals behaving. And it's the, you know, it's the paradox of thrift. If everybody's trying to save at the same time, the economy sinks into, sinks into a depression. So it's, it's the difference between thinking about the economy as a, what's called a complex adaptive system and think about the economy as sort of a clanking machine that, that operates under, under well-known rules. So Paul, he, he mentioned a couple of things that directly affect you and, and what we want to talk about with you. And, and that is this liquidity trap notion. And at, at, a, at the same Paris conference where Bill gave his speech, you know, you presented a paper about central bank policy, basically saying that the that U.S. and much of the developed world are in a quote unquote liquidity trap, and so which also requires new thinking and policies. So, number one, you know, what is a liquidity trap? You know, just define it for us, and why does it require new policies? A liquidity trap is when the private <clears throat> sector, either voluntarily or involuntarily, chooses to delever. Therefore, the private sector is not sensitive to the price of credit. Therefore, they're not sensitive to interest rates. And therefore, monetary policy is not effective anymore. Meaning you go to zero for short-term interest rates and you still don't see a boom in credit creation because the private sector is delevering. Right, so they're, they're, we're getting rid of debt. The private sector is getting rid of right. individuals and companies. Whoever is in debt, they're getting rid of it. Particularly, and so they're not particularly, indi particularly individuals, the household right. sector more so than the corporate sector. And this is very different than most of our lifetime. Because for most of our lifetime, I graduated in 1981 from business school, so at least in that period of time, is that the Fed was in charge of fine-tuning the economy and fiscal policy, taxes and spending, was relegated to the side on the whole notion that if the economy is a little too hot, then you take up interest rates and cool down borrowing. If it's a little too cold, then you take interest rates down and people start borrowing again. And the housing sector was the primary vehicle through what it worked on, as well as the stock market. So the Fed was, you know, fine-tuning because the private sector was elastic or sensitive to changes in the price of credit. So therefore, monetary policy took the lead and fiscal policy, taxes and spending, was a secondary issue in stabilizing the economy. That was wonderful until you had the Minsky moment when the crisis happened and then the reverse Minsky journey, which is what happens after the crisis, which is delevering. Mm -hmm. And essentially what it does is it turns the Federal Reserve into a bartender at an AA meeting. You keep cutting the price, but no one's drinking. Therefore, this is a fundamental paradigm shift. Here we have a Fed that's, you're right, keeping policy very, really easy. You've got a government that has been spending, uh, you know, tremendous amounts of money mm -hmm. to stimulate the economy. And people are saying, you know, why should we be taking on more debt when we're trying to delever? I mean, shouldn't the government as well be delevering? What's wrong with that 
solution. Well, that gets back to the paradox of thrift, which Keynes wrote about and Bill was speaking about. Right. Is what's rational for the individual is not necessarily rational for the community of individuals. And that's the hardest thing for me when I'm actually being an evangelist, if you will, for various public policy issues, is that people want to extrapolate from the individual situation to the macro situation. Right. We hear politicians saying that all the time. If you looked at your household budget and you had too much debt, you should be cutting debt, exactly. not taking on more debt. And you're saying that doesn't work on the macro level. It doesn't work. There, and that's where you have to look at it on a system basis. And one of my simple examples would be thinking in terms of if you're at a ball game or at a concert. It can be rational for you to stand up to get a better view. So at the micro level, it's totally rational. I stand up, I get a better view. But if everybody in your section reaches that decision at the same time, I will stand up to get a better view, what's the outcome? Everybody's standing up, no one's got a better view, and everyone's got <laughs> sore feet. So therefore, what you need is a director saying, would everyone just please sit down? Even though your impulse is, well, if I stand, then I will get a better view. That's only true in a micro sense. In a macro sense, it's not true. So what is true in the macro sense? In the so macro what should sense be is, happening that, that is, again, is, is a new response to this situation we, we need that we to find have ourselves in? The government sector be willing to lever, go in Take debt. Take on more debt, yep. Go on more debt on behalf of the people in order to get our economy more fully employed. So it's not irrational to have fiscal expansion that is done full-throated and with a purpose and without apology uh, in order to get yourself out of a liquidity trap. If the corporate sector tightens up its belt and fires somebody, then they can say, okay, I got my cost base down. That person, unfortunately, I had to fire them, they're gone. For society, however, they're not gone. You still got to feed them. <laughs> So right. if you still got to feed them, it probably makes sense to have them do something productive. So the corporation can fire the person. We as citizens in a democracy are not going to let the person starve. So therefore, when you think in terms of it at the governmental level, then it makes sense how can we employ our unemployed to order to earn, if you will, their three squares a day as opposed to us just giving it to them. So Bill, are you on the same page as, as Paul what, about, what, about what, this? What Paul's actually giving you is a good example of the more abstract thing that I just said about a complex adaptive system right. to where you cannot reason from the behavior of individuals to the behavior of the system. You have to think about the system as a whole and it's, it's systemic behavior. And I think when you look at it from a systemic standpoint, what happens is that, that, that people make predictions based on individual behavior. So, for example, every dollar's worth of, in essence, government debt, right, is an asset to somebody else, every part of the government life. So that's somebody else's asset. So if the government liquidates that, the asset is gone. Mm -hmm. At the same time, every dollar's worth of government spending is income to somebody. So if the government cuts spending, incomes fall. And I think that's where you have to look at it on a systemic basis. What are you trying to accomplish for the system, for the system as a whole? How big does government have to get for it to really kick in, for this to work? I mean, what's... What's the end game? I mean, what, I mean, how much debt is it going to take to stimulate and to get the private sector to start hiring again? I think you have to look at the government's obligations, which are really intergenerational, and then you have to look at the debt issue. I think we can have a lot more debt on Uncle Sam, so I don't think we've hit a limit on debt. In fact, I think we should purposely increase it so as to increase GDP, because mm -hmm. we're always looking at debt burdens as debt to GDP. There's two halves of this ratio. Right. And if I can actually increase debt and increase GDP by more than I increase debt, then actually I've created alchemy uh, called Keynesian alchemy, I suppose. Uh, so I don't worry about the limitations in the short run to putting people to work if we really want to do it with dispatch. The key issue in our fiscal issue as a country is that our generation, right, baby you mean boomers. Bill, our generation have been promised that which our children's generation will have to pay outrageous taxes in order to fulfill. Because essentially we run a pay-as-you-go retirement system and a pay-as-you-go health care system. So essentially we as a people, as a democracy, have over-promised to the baby boom generation. For our kids to deliver on the promises to our generation means they're going to have outrageously high tax burdens. We could do it, 
but it will be very outrageously high tax burdens on the next generation, which will have negative effect on the economy, but also raises the fundamental issue of fairness. So I look at it as the big physical issue is the intergenerational issue between the baby boomers and their children, not debt per se. I agree that probably more government spending may be, may be necessary, but right now you're in a case where we're, we're creating about 200,000 jobs in the last few months in the private sector. And, um, and the public sector is still in a case of losing jobs. But, but nominal GDP growth is now running four, four and a half percent. And that, you know, that, that, so that's about, with, that's about two percent real, right? It's about, it's about between two and two and a half percent real, okay. right? Which is not great, but it's, it's better than it's been. It's not great, but the key point here is that we're, the 10 year treasury is two and a quarter, nominal. And the 30-year Treasury, which we're not with the finance rate, the 10-year Treasury. So we're actually we're actually growing faster than our debt burden is increasing, and that's how we got out of the problem after World War II. Yeah. So as long as we can keep those those policy rates below the nominal growth rate of the economy, effectively, you're, the, Paul mentioned the debt to GDP. The GDP is growing. Fa the real GDP is growing faster than the real debt, and the debt burden decreases every day. So the, the Fed has told us in this, this new era of transparency that they're going to keep short-term interest rates low until through 2014, right? Is the, the Fed going to be able to keep interest rates low? And what does that do to the markets? The Fed can keep interest rates across the entire term structure bounded at low levels. Right. Not at a point, but bounded at right. low levels if they're willing to peg the rate they do control uh, the Fed funds rate at near zero for as far as the eye can see. Uh, the bond market essentially involves a yield curve and long rates are expected short rates plus a risk premium. Because you always have the alternative of just rolling over three month bills right. or you could buy a five year note. Then you don't have to do something every three months. But when you think in terms of how to value a five year note, you think in terms of the alternative of rolling a three-month bill every three months. So if the Fed controls a three-month bill, then essentially it impacts very directly the value of a five-year note and, and therefore a 10-year note uh, because long-term rates are expected short rates plus a risk premium. Now what the Fed doesn't control nearly as much is the risk premium itself and it will bounce around. They are pre-committed to keeping rates near zero through 2014. And away from the pre-commitment, everything that Ben has ever told us about his understanding of liquidity traps is he's going to stay down at this level. Right. Un until he sees the economy become stronger, until unemployment falls, until... So he's got his markers. He's got right? his markers, and his biggest marker is that a repeat of 19 and 37 when the Fed tightened up and threw us back into the Depression is not going to happen on his, his watch. watch. Mm -hmm. There will be no 1937s under Ben. Uh, so rates can move up from under two to two and a quarter simply because the risk premium for holding a longer term Treasury increases. And in fact, it has. Because I look, and we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. I look at long Treasuries in some respects as a call option on Armageddon. That if the end of the world is going to happen, I want to have long treasuries, canned green peas, and small <laughs> firearms. And in recent weeks, the notion that the end of the world is going to happen has gone down in consensus probability correctly, I think. Okay. So therefore, treasuries as part of your canned green pea portfolio are, have lost attraction. If we know that the Fed's controlling the short-term interest rates and that they're going to keep them low for the foreseeable future, then are the calls that some strategists are making, they're saying that the, the generational bull market in bonds is over and that, in fact, the best investment that you can make is to short treasuries. Is that premature? I certainly want to own other assets relative to treasuries, put differently. I think that cash, which has been held very highly uh, and in high esteem by a lot of investors, needs to come down. And that will probably have a positive impact on the PE multiple for stocks and could increase long-term interest rates marginally. Maybe shorting the 10-year note, and particularly shorting the 10-year note against the S&P 500 as a single trade, 
I can buy into that one. So, Bill, as far as you know, what you're seeing happen in, in the Treasury market and, and the fact that rates are still, it looks like, going to stay low for several years, what does that do to the stock market? The risk premium for equities is very high. I mean, you're getting paid a lot of money to take a little bit of risk. And in the U.S. equity market right now, you can buy high-quality businesses with yields higher than the 10-year Treasury and with dividends that will go up. That payment on the 10-year Treasury is not going up. And you get a free call option on growth. So it's hard to see why anybody would own 10-year treasuries, except unless they're in the Armageddon camp that Paul was talking about. But if you believe that the U.S. is a going concern, then I think that owning, owning U.S. equities, especially large-cap equities, relative to treasuries is, is an easy thing. And I also think that, that it's, it's the case that, that rising interest rates right now, especially at the 10-year level and above, are, is bullish for equities. Yeah. Part of the reason that rates have gone up is that people have marked up their estimates for growth. Stock markets had a very good first quarter, and I think what's happened is as, as people have seen the, the job numbers, they're like, wait a minute, things aren't all that bad, and we might even be at this escape velocity where the Fed, we don't need a QE3 and the economy's doing okay, so I don't need this protection that, in Treasury anymore, and I can take a little bit more risk on the equity side. But it's very early, very early days in that. I mean, I, I do think I'd, I'd be more definitive than Paul. I wouldn't necessarily be be more correct than Paul, but I'm more definitive <laughs> than, than Paul in saying that the 30-year bull market in bonds is over in the U.S. It's probably over in Germany, yeah. and it's probably over in you know many other places, too. I would have no quarrel with that. The nasty bear that follows the bull is not going to be nasty for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I just happen to be, as an old bond man, uh, very warm and fuzzy about stocks for quite some time, and actually particularly since uh, actually something that happened here in Europe when the ECB announced uh, the LTRO for three-year financing of sovereign bonds, I became a table-thumping uh, And that's, bull that's the long-term refinancing. Yeah, basically right. it was the, it was the, the, LTRO the, it was the ECB, the European yep. Central Bank, saying Armageddon's not going to happen in Europe. Europe doesn't look all that positive, and believe me, it doesn't. But the ECB stood up and said, Armageddon will not happen as long as we have a printing press and we get our ink for free. And that was a change and a welcome change from yeah. the ECB. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. So, Bill, what's kind of the one thing that maybe that we as individual investors should think about differently in, in, in the markets? Is, is there, you know, one approach that you would recommend that we consider? Yeah, I, I'd say there's, there's probably, you know, a linked twofold approach. One of them is to be very mistrustful of easy metaphors and analogies about households and governments and solutions. You know, Hank Paulson made a comment that that uh, that uh, they did a poll in, in, uh, after after he had left office, and 60 percent of the people in the United States disapproved of torture, and 92 percent disapproved of quote bailouts. So I think there's a you know there, there's a certain moral moral aspect to the way people think about this that economically isn't isn't very sound both from a, both from an economic standpoint and from a from a moral hazard standpoint. So that's the that's the first linkage. And the second thing I would say would be that that given where we are right now at the end of a 30-year bull market in Treasuries and a long period of zero rates of return in equities, that the single best thing people can actually do in the market is to actually think long term and be patient in a world that's very short term and noisy. Paul. I one idea, one approach that we should be considering as investors. I certainly have to agree with what Bill just said. I mean, I, as a macro man, I really advocate the notion of looking at macroeconomics and an analytical framework as opposed to a moral framework. Because the moment you get into the notion of individual morality, you will get macroeconomics all screwed up. Uh, number two, I certainly agree uh, with the notion that uh, equities are due to have their time in the sun, uh, and treasuries are due to have their time in the cellar, uh, which is a profound sort of change. And I guess the third thing that comes to my mind is that real estate, which for our generation and our parents' generation was the asset class, and then took everybody uh, around the head and shoulders the last five years, it's probably an asset worth looking at. Uh, not, in, not every house on every street corner, uh, but I think that the property market is so out of favor because of people's most recent experience uh, that there are probably some uh, good opportunities finally in the property market. It is truly a hated asset class. So I'm actually starting to uh, 
uh, keep my eyes uh, more sharply focused on the uh, on the property market. I'm in Southern California, so we have a lot of displaced sort of stuff. But there is value in the notion of roofs because you've got to have one. <laughs> <laughs> Paul McCulley and Bill Miller, always such a treat to have you on Wealth Track, and, and I'm looking forward to continuing this discussion. Thank so you. thanks very much for joining us this week in Paris. Thank you, Consuela. Thanks very much, Consuela. I hope you can join us next week for part two of our exclusive conversation with great investors Bill Miller and Paul McCulley. Our focus will be the markets and their investment recommendations. They will not disappoint. And that concludes this edition of Wealth Track. Thank you for watching. Enjoy your Easter and Passover weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market.